Here to help break down the statement, former Dallas Fed advisor Daniel DiMartino Booth, Moody's chief economist John Lonsky is with us, Hal Lambert of Point Bridge Capital, Heritage Capital founder Paul Schatz, and CIO of the Bonson Group, David Bonson, joins us as well. All right, Daniel, let me just, you know, it's a lot of information, uh, the Dow waffling around a little bit, uh, but moving to, to moving a little bit lower here. What's the biggest initial takeaway? I, I, I literally said wow out loud when I heard that, that there is not a majority of those on the committee who are anticipating another rate cut this year. This completely flies in the face of what the market this is This year or anticipating. next year, right? Uh, is that or a, next year. The, the, the next the, move is a rate hike. A rate hike in 2021. I mean, I, I, again, I, I have one word for you, and that's wow. Really, uh, truly. David, the, uh, the, the dissent was there last time we had, you know, the, you, you had Rosengren and George who dissented. Bullard wanted uh, a, a larger rate cut. Yeah. Uh, but um, it certainly seems like the Jay Powell or the Powell doctrine not influencing the, his fellow members, whatever that might be, by the way. Well, not influencing him to cast their vote the right way, but still getting the same outcome. So, you know, you're losing a few votes, but he's still running the day in terms of what he's wanting to see. That issue about them projecting a rate hike in 2020 as opposed to uh, another cut, I just want to remind everyone, last time we had election year 2016, we started off the year with them anticipating four rate hikes that year, we got a donut. Nothing. They, I don't believe it for a second. I think they'll adjust that as soon as the market goes down. Speaking, speaking of adjustments, John, many came into today thinking that the dot plot will be one of the things that Powell would have to explain to in the Q&A. And sort of, I mean, there have been talk about them dumping this whole so-called dot plot uh, because it's been so confusing and, to David's yeah. point, has been so wrong. That's exactly right. I think they should get rid of this dot plot. These guys have done poorly as forecasters. It borders on the ridiculousness. I think that this forecast of the next move being a rate hike is absolutely meaningless, given all the uncertainty that we face. Let me ask our market guys. I'll start with you, Hal. Uh, essentially unchanged right now. We were down in the, about 55 points, uh, but we were off as much as 124. We were off as much as 30 points. It typically takes a day for Wall Street to digest all of this news. I'm really shocked, though, that the initial move hasn't been more dramatic. What's your take? Yeah, I agree. I think, look, this is a mistake. Once again, we're going to see what Chairman Powell says after this. But, you know, they should have, I think they should have cut 50 basis points. Uh, I think it is crazy to think that they're going to raise rates in 2020. That's not going to happen. But what, what, what we are is we're out of whack with the rest of the world, right? So our real interest rates right now are zero. We have about 1.8% inflation. We have about 1.8% 10-year. So we're zero. But in Germany, it's negative 2%. In the UK, it's negative 1.5%, meaning if you buy a bond in Germany, you're losing 2% every year. So so what's going to happen? You're going to move money to the United States. So flows are going to come. The 10 years probably going lower in yield. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't break back through 140 again. And, and we're going to be out of whack. We just simply are. And so the Fed's going to be forced to cut rates more. Uh, so they'll probably do another 25 basis points this year. I think the market's going to force them to do it. The dollar's going to rally, which is, hurts us on a trade perspective. And you're going to see President Trump out tweeting on this. I, I, I feel certain about that. How, I mean, David, you're shaking your head. Why? I, I just don't understand the reasoning that we have to go take our P's and Q's from what Germany is doing. I understand the reality that it plays into the calculus, okay? But what if Germany decided to set their, what if their yield was negative 300 basis points? Are we supposed to chase them all the way negative? At some point, they have to look at to what the economy is doing. Did they get too tight? Yes, they did. Do they need to lose? You mean the U.S. Yeah. Fed? The U.S. Fed right. got, too, got too tight last year. I get that. But uh, credit markets are working. There is no reason for them to make their entire driver of monetary policy what someone's doing in another country. Let me ask you, Danielle. Yeah, uh, but, but well, have... Hold on one second. I'll bring it back in. And also, Paul, I want to get to Paul, too. But um, in the last 24 hours, uh, what happened in the repo market? I mean, very simplistically, I would just tell anyone who asks on the street, our financial system ran out of cash. Uh, yeah, and it's, a, a, it's and, a supply demand mismatch. Right. So, I mean, how does that happen? In the, and uh, apparently the Fed tried to address that today. Many thought the best way for them to address this is to get back to quantitative easing. Or at least quantitative easing, easing light. I mean, you, how, how, how can you come in every day with an emergency measure? That's just bad optics. I mean, if you're, you're, you're the Fed, financial stability is one of your mandates. You're supposed to be tamping that down. And this, it, this introduces the element of uncertainty on a daily basis. It's, it, this is ridiculous. It's terrible for credibility, no matter what. I know the experts say it's no big deal. You had a whole bunch of things that, you know, like Holly's comment, that comes around every now and then, but don't worry but about it. But it's liquidity that, 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 that triggered the financial crisis in the first place. I mean, they really have to address this. They have to address oh. financial stability. 
Well, I'm sorry, you know, you know, the good news right now is that we don't have a financial crisis. If we did, this would be a much more serious problem with the shortage of liquidity. But here we have an example. Not only can the Fed not forecast interest rates, the Fed cannot in, cannot even fulfill one of its primary functions, and that is to assure adequate systemic liquidity. One of its easiest functions. They weren't yeah, even easiest. able to perform. Right. But, David, is this the right reaction in this, in this reaction in your mind so far? The, the, the reality is 150 points it went up. Uh, it was you know, down 100, down 30. Uh, it's not a big deal. It's not very much movement percentage-wise. But we'll see what happens in the presser, as always. But I agree he needs to provide clarity. But let me point out something. He could clarify in a way that Bernanke never did and Yellen never did. We will not allow negative yields in the United States of America. Yeah. He could put a firm policy out there. That would and be more would to help benefit? markets That would anything. help our markets. Our markets would go up on that? Tremendously. It is the biggest destabilizing force out there right now that with a world of 16 trillion negative yields, there's ambiguity about what the United States and But Danielle, are. a week ago, Mario Draghi said that negative yields were phenomenal. I mean, he got giddy oh when, he, when, they were at, when he was asked about this. He said, listen, he is I know there's risk, but it's been phenomenal. It's worked oh. out great. He took a victory lap. He says that if it wasn't for the ECB, they created 11 million jobs in Europe. They staved off recession and that single-handedly, without any help from fiscal policy, their central bank saved today. And we hear often Jay Powell sound the same way. Look, that, that is just flat out delusional. Over 50 percent of Europe's economy was really mad and came out publicly against what Mario Draghi did. This man is going, he's, he's shepherding a con, an, an economy well, that's going into recession. Right. Well, he's there till Halloween. Sure. But he's shepherding an, an economy that's going to go into recession before he could even raise interest rates out of negative territory. To your point, they're the most destabilizing force right now in the global financial system. And they're also, by the way, feeding into this liquidity situation here that we've been dealing with these past 48 hours. All right. So, David, uh, the thing also is, of course, I felt the very first question last time out the gate. I know maybe it shouldn't be this way, but I think Jay Powell is human like the rest of us. And the constant attacks from President Trump, it felt like he was taking uh, he was attacking President Trump. He brought up China trade often during that first question last time in a way that he hadn't really brought it up before, because prior to that, he has said that the actual economic impact had been really de minimis. I mean, you know, it's the threat, the anxiety, maybe pulling back on certain things. But the actual economic impact to a $21 trillion economy had been little. But he brought it up a lot, and it seemed to be counterpunching. In my mind, that's the way I interpreted it. And the market started to sell off because it felt like if Powell starts to lose focus on his primary job, and gets into a tit for tat with the president of the United States. That does no one any 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 good. Yeah, well, uh, Jay Powell has a lot of catching up to do if he's going to get into a tit for tat with what the president has mm-hmm. done with him. And I, I, you know, that enemy of the United States comment comes to mind. Uh, listen, I think that the reality is that is a very good chance we would have gotten 50 basis points cut today if it weren't for the president's tweets. I think that now Powell is in a position of being afraid of looking like he's capitulating. But should he to do that? President. Should he care? No, he should not. And I'm not saying it's even conscious. Right, right. I don't mean to play a psychologist here. I hate it when people do it with the president. But I'm just saying I think that the president overplayed right. that and it perhaps had a negative effect. All right, David, I was thinking on the way in this morning, we had two major, well, I can't call them major because they didn't impact the markets the way that I thought they were, but two would-be black swan events. The attack on Saudi Arabia. I mean, black swan being something no one thought was going to happen, not, and that not mm-hmm. a single person had an inkling it could happen. No. Going into the weekend, we didn't think drones could take out half of Saudi Arabia's oil capacity, and we didn't think the New York Fed would have to pump money into the system. These, are, these in the past, could have been two separate black swan events that could have started the dominoes going down. I mean, is that saying something about at least the resolve of our economy and the markets? I, I, I wish it were, but I'm not sure that that's what it is. I think it has more to do with these events, that these events actually do point to something that was inherently transitory and not really uh, a fundamentally you know, undermining of the economic strength. I do believe that they point to problems and weaknesses and vulnerabilities, but they didn't become a fundamental weakness. Guys, on the screen we're showing right now, yeah. President Trump has just tweeted, Jay Powell and the Federal Reserve fell again. No guts. No sense, no vision, a terrible communicator. He's saying that before the press conference. <laughs> Gosh, okay. give the guy a chance. It's a retweet. 